Good afternoon, everybody. This place really echoes. Can you hear me? All right, I can hear me. We've got a great panel here on an absolutely critical topic, and I'm so glad everybody here at Geothermal House has taken the time to listen to this panel on emerging economies and the promise that Geothermal holds. Look, I was struck by a couple statistics as we kicked off New York Climate Week. First was, although $2 trillion went into the clean energy economy in 2023, double that into fossil fuels, only 15% went to emerging economies in developing countries. The rest went to advanced economies and China. That clearly means we aren't doing what we need to in the parts of the world that right now both matter most to climate change and are being affected the most by climate change. The, the second statistic was that the level of investment would need to increase 2x around the world, but 4x in the emerging economies in particular. That's why I'm so pleased we've got this distinguished panel here today to talk about the challenges and opportunities in emerging markets and how geothermal could actually play a critical role one that's currently underappreciated. So I'm looking to my left here. I'm going to start with uh, introducing Zirin. Zirin Osho is the India Director at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. Most recently was at the International Solar Alliance uh, and has a degree from the Fletcher School. It's great to have you, Zirin. Thank you so much. To her left is my dear friend, Arunabha Ghosh, the president of CEO, co-founder of CEEW, the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water Quality. Arnaba, among his literally six pages of accolades, let me just mention that he's led CEEW to the top ranks of one of Asia's leading public policy think tanks and research institutions. It's one of the world's 20 best climate think tanks, and he holds a doctorate from the University of Oxford. And then finally, Merrick Gogri, all the way over there, head of strategy at Arthi Industries, where he's also deeply involved in his family office, Spectrum Impact, using his family's resources to create an impact across climate, sustainability, health, and education. Alum of IIT Bombay. Yeah, thank good you. To, good to have you all. Let's get started. We've got 40 minutes and a lot of, a lot of uh, content to cover. Let's get started. Let me start with you, Arunaba, because I want to set the stage. Can you give us an overview of the key challenges that India faces to decarbonize. Because although we're talking broadly about emerging economies, all three of our panelists here have a specific expertise in India. Tell us about India's current energy use by sector, and then let's break down the routes to decarbonizing the power and the industrial sectors in particular. Right, okay. Okay. Um, uh, Varun, thank you. And, and great to be with all of you here. I, I hear a little bit of an echo. I just hope the, the echo around the need for clean energy investments goes outside of this hall as well. So what's the challenge? Let's put it this way. Uh, before we get into the energy space, let's understand what the role a country like India is playing in the global economy. It is now the world's fastest growing major economy, which means India and other emerging markets are basically the locomotives in front of the train, pulling the entire global economy forward. So when we think about their decarbonization, it cannot come at the cost of slowing down the energy growth, because that means it slows down the economic growth, which then has a spillover impact for global economic growth. So this is why what happens in India matters for the world, and what happens in the rest of the world matters to India. Right now, India is the world's fifth largest electricity market. But it has already over 200,000 megawatts of non-fossil electricity capacity, which amounts to about 46% of its installed capacity. However, capacity and generation are different. The bulk of the power generation is still coming from fossil fuels, about three quarters of our generation. So what's the first big challenge? The first big challenge is, and if you accept my premise that you can't slow down the economic growth, the first big challenge is not about shutting down coal, but massively injecting non-fossil capacity into this 
rapidly growing economy whose energy sector is growing even faster than the economy. In order to do that, we've got to look beyond the vanilla renewables, and I guess we will get into that conversation in a bit. The second big challenge is that countries like India are also the workshops of the world. So that's where your industrial energy decarbonization becomes absolutely critical. About a little over a fifth of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from the industrial sector, which comprises on one hand 200,000 really large plants and about 60 million small, micro, small, and medium enterprises. Decarbonizing that entire long tail is a second big challenge. And the third is that India is on the move, quite literally. Uh, urban India is already the world's third largest country by population. And yet into our cities will move another, say, half a billion people over the next two, three decades. How they move, how they cool themselves, etc., will be a new driver of our energy demand. So these are the kind of vectors along which we have to start thinking about decarbonization in a rapidly uh, accelerated sp space and pace, but without slowing down the economy, because if India slows down, then the world slows down, and that's not good for anyone. Thanks, Arunaba. Let me, let me follow up and drill in, no pun intended, <laughs> a little more deeply on one of the sectors you mentioned. Let's talk about electricity, because we'll, we'll get to heat in a moment with Merrick. In electricity, India has actually been an absolute pioneer in, uh, among emerging economies on, as you mentioned, bringing these vanilla renewables to market. Intermittent wind, solar, onshore, and now batteries. How far is that going to get us, and what gap does that still leave, that intermittency that needs to be filled, and is there a role if we could do geothermal cost-effectively, is there a role for clean base load geothermal in India? Well, that's a two-part question, uh, Varun. So the first, the first part is, you know, um, let's, let's look at the way the, the curve is going, right? This is not an S-curve. This is a snake curve. You know, there are multiple S's in India's energy transition. And we are only at the beginning of one of those S's. In 2010, when the solar mission began in India, with less than 20 megawatts of solar. 20 megawatts of solar. And now we have about 80,000 megawatts of solar, 150,000 megawatts of solar and wind, etc., plus the large hydro, plus a nuclear, so you get to that 200,000 megawatts. Uh, this is what I call the low-hanging fruit, the vanilla renewables. Now, when you look at the pace at which the energy demand is growing, power demand, the, the economy is growing at 7%, power demand is growing at 12%, peak power demand is growing at 14%. So India now needs to deploy from about 15, 16 gigawatts a year of clean energy capacity to 50 gigawatts a year, more than a 3x increase. So that's another part of that snake curve. Now, all of this is not going to come only from vanilla renewables. You can add some storage to this. The latest auctions that happened in Gujarat earlier this year uh, showed that solar plus storage can get you prices lower than, than, uh, than coal. However, the storage capacity requirement in 2026, 27, just a couple of years, is likely to be 16 gigawatts alone. And, uh, with storage of about 82 gigawatt hours. And this storage capacity is expected to increase to 73 gigawatts demand by 2031. Now, on one hand, you can say the demand is coming, the supply should automatically fill it. The problem is there are supply chain bottlenecks. The prices you get for storage plus solar might vary, or storage plus wind might vary from place to place. So I think the, the latter, the, the 2B question that you had was, I think we need all technologies, and if geothermal can help increase that confidence that the base load will be provided, it reduces the incentive for the power system planner to say, I love renewables, but right now I need some additional coal. It's that margin play at which we've got to win. That you can't expect the power planner to say, 
I want renewables, but I need to drive this economy as well. And right now, I don't, like, not, right now, meaning next month, I don't have the power capacity, and I've got a very hot summer coming up. Therefore, I have to keep the coal power plant going. So if geothermal can help play a sort of catalytic role in switching and nudging those marginal decisions, I think the power system as a whole benefits, but then geothermal also begins to get a fairly large market to play in. That's fascinating. We're going to come back to this, Arnaba, because you know, what I'm gathering from you is, hey, it's not just a technical challenge. There's also a psychology component here. If you can take away that excuse of, yeah, renewables just aren't going to cut it, and if you can bring geothermal into the mainstream consciousness of Indian policymakers, and if on the margins, little changes have big impacts on the system, that could be a route to market. Let me go to Merrick here. Um, Merrick, fascinated by what Arthi Industries is doing. I'd love for you to share with our audience a little more about Arthi and why decarbonization is both so important to you and why it's so difficult. Walk us through, now I'm, I guess I'm giving you three A, B, C, and D. Walk us through the challenge of decarbonizing industrial heat, the different temperature thresholds, what processes happen in each one, and what the size of the prize is. What would it take to decarbonize some or all of the process heat in your industry? Sure. So thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for the question. And I think Project Inner Space and Jamie for the invite. Uh, so let me just give you some background on Arti Industries. So Arti is a large-scale chemical manufacturing company with plants in Western India. And uh, we use a lot of coal or a lot of fossil fuels for our industrial heat requirement. And so one thing about uh, electricity. Now, if you look at the prices right now, as Arunabha mentioned, solar and wind, just the hybrid price is not including the storage component, we can actually get it cheaper than coal. But if I compare the use of coal for steam versus the use of uh, electricity to generate steam, and actually it's sort of not right. Yeah, you are having a better source of energy in electricity, and you are sort of generating heat out of it. It's not the most ideal thing to do. And when you do the maths right now, it's very, very expensive from just an electrification perspective. So when we thought at RT that what are our ways to decarbonize, we realized that electrification, I don't think, will ever work uh, until unless you get renewable prices next to zero, which is, again, it will have its own time journey. Uh, then what are the other options? So one of the options that we were looking at is, again, carbon capture. Truth be told, the CapEx investment around carbon capture, that's also not that easy to look at. And there were two options which intrigued us, uh, and we are sort of pursuing both of them. One was India is an agrarian economy, so can we use agriculture bio-waste for boilers uh, as a fuel source, but the thing around geothermal is very fascinating because uh, you have to also keep in mind the land footprint. When we are talking about an uh, industrial plant, we are not talking about huge amounts of land. These are in clusters in uh, industrial locations. So something like a geothermal does fit the, uh, tick mark the box in terms of land area footprint as well. Your potential cost of fuel goes out because your cost, it's, there is no fuel cost as such. Uh, in terms of the heat requirement, I would class classify it into three different parts. One will be like less than 120 degrees Celsius, uh, which is generally used for drying and all those kind of uh, unit operations. Uh, then will be the heat that we tend to use, which is for industrial processes, where you are doing the distillation columns and all those chemical processes. That's the 200 to 250, 300 degrees Celsius. And the third one is at greater than 500, which is, again, I would think that will require a different level of geothermal itself. So in my mind, I classify geothermal as sort of shallow geothermal for the 80, 90 degree heat, then mid-scale, and then the deep geothermal, where effectively you can choose between getting power or industrial heat, because you are at 500, 600 degrees. So from an RT perspective, we are definitely looking at this option, and we are working closely with Project Inner Space, trying to make a feasibility study at some of our sites. The good thing is, uh, I think the geothermal gradient is pretty good in our locations. And that's something that also I would want to highlight, and we are discussing with Arunabha and the team at CEW. Can we map what Project Inner Space is doing in terms of mapping the geothermal gradients on top of uh, mapping the wind potential and solar potential? Now imagine that yeah. Yeah. mixture and how powerful it can be for local jurisdiction to then decide what sort of industrial uh, assets you need to put or uh, energy sources. Now, 
Amir, that's super helpful. And I hope everybody heard the three different temperature ranges. Um, two quick follow-ups. The first is, how much of the prize is outside of the highest temperature range? You know, are we talking 10% or a much larger percentage of your processes happen at the medium and the low process heat? So in, in case of the chemical industry, I would say mid to low caters to 95% of the process. So I don't think uh, that's uh, the high processes are generally when you go to metallurgical industries yeah. or those kind of industries. So in that ways, if we are able to get even 200 degrees Celsius, 250 degrees Celsius, 75% of the chemical industry, I can surely say, can be potentially decarbonized. And, and that's a you know, mind-blowing statistic, that 75% of that key Indian industry is amenable to uh, the temperatures geothermal can achieve. The second follow-up is, look, you, not to say the pun again, but you've drilled deep, Merrick, but most folks in Indian industry have not. Most folks probably don't know very much about geothermal. Have you been surprised by, as you've done the technical analysis, and as Innerspace is doing the mapping, have you been surprised by the availability of the geothermal resource in India? And will others be surprised by it? So I have been surprised, I think, for me. And in fact, uh, we are also at a family office level investors in Quiz. So we have a very good insights on geothermal since a few years now. Uh, I think I would say we are one of the leaders in the space. But my hope is, because when we mapped out the plant in our location, we yeah. realized that the minimum size of the plant will exceed our demand. Wow. So that is where you will have to have collaboration as well. I yeah. need to get the whole cluster decarbonized. Yeah. So naturally, the next step for us will be take a feasibility study, not for us, but to take a cluster approach and go down that pathway. Uh, I, I think one of the key challenges and will be around policy because when we, in India, like there is, I don't think there is any policy for geothermal in a mature way because there is no geothermal resource to be known, right? And there's only one geothermal plant, I think, in Ladakh, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to be one key bottleneck that I foresee for every one of us here. If we really want to take geothermal to the next level, how do we ensure the policy is up to date and not like when the technology is ready, suddenly we say, okay, now the policy will take three, four years to figure out. So while there will be interest and interest will grow, we just need to ensure that the momentum is not lost. Uh, Terrific. Thank you. We'll come back to you and Aarti. I want to come to Zarin now um, and, and take a little bit of a broader policy lens as India looks to decarbonize. Um, I know you've done a lot of work thinking, for example, about potential carbon market approaches in India. Can you talk to us about the broader policy landscape that India is both, has already passed and is considering enacting, and what that could mean for bringing an emerging technology like geothermal into the marketplace? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Varun. So, uh, just based on you know, the comments that both Arunaba and Merik were talking about, it's very important to highlight the fact that India is currently in a space where they're looking to launch um, their compliance, domestic compliance markets, which are going to be active starting 2026. It's called the India Carbon Markets. And a large part of what the carbon markets or the, the way the government of India envisions launching those is to essentially incentivize the decarbonization process. I think one fact that I want to add before I actually answer your question is decarbonization happens in the longer term. It's a hundred year horizon. It's the end of the century, right? What we need to start discussing about in the near term is the heat stress, the growing heat stress that is going to kill us. Uh, in the national capital of India, Delhi, we had temperatures cross 50 degrees centigrade this summer. So decarbonization alone doesn't necessarily solve the problem of survivability and testing human limits of survivability. What's very important to do in the near term is also to look at what needs to be coupled with decarbonization in the short term, in the near term, to be able to uh, reap near-term benefits, and that comes from the mitigation, active mitigation of short-lived climate pollutants and uh, 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 greenhouse gases. And those are generally the non-carbon dioxide bucket of gases, right? So you have methane, you have black carbon, you have HFCs, NOx, SOx emissions. The geothermal energy provides us with an opportunity to actually move away from coal. And Arunaba, of course, spoke of you know, what the pathways look like and how you can't just say no to coal tomorrow, but you start pumping in more and more renewables, geothermal being one very important one of them. 
what that also does is it gives you a lot of mitigation from coal, not just the carbon dioxide emissions, but also the emissions, say, of coal bed methane, mm. which are just a couple of days ago, there was a study that um, came out which says that India's methane emissions are on track to double uh, by the end of this decade. So if you want to get a dual approach and succeed in the decarbonization process of India, it's very important to club these together and sort of have a holistic, uh, integrated resource planning approach to it. With the carbon markets, what needs to be done, which is also going to help geothermal take an active role and make it more mainstream, is a, of course, the awareness bit that I'm very glad to hear that there is the private sector moving forward in this. There is actually a geothermal policy of India, but it's nowhere close to you know, its actual developmental phase the way we have seen in solar, for example. What would be needed is first and foremost the awareness of the technology. ONGC along with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy have located 350 geothermal sites in India. And the largest of that is the Sonata Basin, which yeah. is, I'm assuming, your Rajasthan Gujarat based. So that part of the world, or in the country at least, certainly has a huge potential. Uh, when we work at the sub-national level, we've also seen a lot of the state governments come to us and say, we have industrial zones. So, you know, moving away from, say, deployment of coal or gas, which is what happens in mostly in North India, if you could club those industrial zones Together. and provide district heating and um, energy, electricity through geothermal sources, especially in geographic locations like the Sonata Basin, it becomes a no-brainer. So, with that sort of an approach, which is an integrated approach, mixing that or superimposing that with the launch of the India carbon market gives you a huge uh, leverage in sort of making this possible. The other thing is that the government of India also has a 100% foreign direct investment approach to geothermal energy. So the question that in my opinion, we should be asking the government is, what role can the government play in becoming the market enabler mm. to deploy technologies by creating an investable project pipeline like Aarti Industries, club it with the India carbon markets because the frameworks are yet to be developed, and then you can leverage credits, which is an additional revenue source. You decarbonize. You also get benefits in the near term through SLCP mitigation. And over and above that, you're also looking at FDI coming into the country, which is absolutely critical for you know, a country like India. Look, I, I think this point about the Indian government trying to decide what role it can play to become the market shaper, as you've said, is the critical question. Arnaba, I want to come to you on this, because for multiple other technologies, I can think of at least two, you have been, and I'm not exaggerating, you have been the Modi administration's or the government of India's consigliere to multiple administrations, to be clear. Um, and by consigliere, I mean, you know, uh, you have offered very helpful and impartial advice across the life cycle of bringing new technologies to market, from the technology development to the market creation uh, to the international relations. Can you walk us through at least two of those examples? I'm thinking of your role setting up the International Solar Alliance, your role in the green hydrogen uh, process, and maybe link to what it would take for geothermal to follow a similar roadmap, but we're all impatient here uh, and at Innerspace to compress that timeline a little bit. Yeah, um, the, the, the way I would answer your question, Varun, is you know, what lessons can we derive from India's experience in, as you say, accelerating the move from an early level of technological readiness to a reasonably mature market, which might be applicable not just to India, but some other emerging markets as well. The first lesson, uh, which actually comes from how we design the solar mission in India, is to recognize that we are poor countries. It's a good thing to recognize that you're a poor country. Because if you think you're a rich country, you start subsidizing these things with feed-in tariffs, etc., and then you, then you run out of money and your market comes to a crashing halt. Exhibit A, Southern Europe, right? Uh, so India sidestepped that approach by having reverse auctions introduced, and CW was involved in the very first set of auctions, 
which brought in that market competition very early on. So that's lesson number one. Lesson number two is that scale matters. And scale matters especially for large economies, but also if you can aggregate demand. Because uh, by offering that scale, in growing economies, you're avoiding what is called the substitution effect. Hmm. You're avoiding and sidestepping the, um, the political economy that we find in the US or in Europe, where you're substituting clean energy for uh, fossil energy. Whereas in emerging economies, you're adding capacity by offering giant scale. That came not just with the solar mission and regular upgrades, but now let's take, Varun just mentioned, the green hydrogen mission. Again, I was involved in, in, in designing it. Um, it's the world's second largest green hydrogen mission after the United States. When you get that kind of scale, some of the largest conglomerates in the country sit up and take notice. The third lesson is that technology collaboration matters. And something that India and the United States did, uh, originally under the Obama administration that has carried on in fits and starts in a way, was what we call the Joint Clean Energy R&D Centers. Uh, again, CW was involved in facilitating what was at that time about $125 million R&D facility. At that time, our problems were lowering cost of solar, increasing energy efficiency, second generation biofuels, but you can add new verticals. You can add geothermal into that mix. You can add small modular reactors into that mix. Mm. How do you do the tech collaboration so that you are co-developing the next generation of technology? Right. Uh, now, these are all lessons that we've already had over the past decade and a half that we can do. We can now, rather than do it in an incremental way and in a linear sequential way, so why don't we do all of that together? Let's introduce market competition here and now. Let's offer scale with policy clarity, uh, which both Mirika and Azarina mentioned. And let's also start doing the tech collaboration with like-minded partners. I think we can crunch this time scale from a decade and a half to about two or three years and start filling in some of those gaps. Now that appeals, two to three years, that appeals. If we can learn those lessons you've learned the hard way and accelerate this journey. Mirik, let's look ahead five or even 10 years. Let's say Arthi has actually achieved its decarbonization goals. Where do you see Arthi as a result of that? What competitive advantage have you achieved? Uh, and how has Arthi then contributed to India's decarbonization? What's the impact in 10 years? So yeah, I think there are two parts to the answer. One is obviously in Arti's own journey, uh, as, as slowly, slowly the pressure around decarbonization is in rightfully increasing. So we are seeing customers asking for like our product carbon footprints and things around that. And truth be told, right now it's not that pressing. It's just asking for those informations, uh, giving certain indication of commitments and things like that. But that's going to only ramp up. So we want to stay ahead of the curve in that way, try to figure out if we are able to decarbonize then we can offer the customers the same product at a lower carbon footprint and there are two things that can happen with that one is the customer can get more price potentially but i think the bigger thing will be give us more volumes and there are two ways to increase prof profitability right and in an ideal world they do both but i think realistically giving more volumes is definitely going to be there i think the broader thing that we as rt would look at is how can we help lead this transition like how can we play the leadership role because one feeling or one uh, vision at RT or even our family offices, it's not about one company at the end of the day, right? When you look at the whole green transition, and in fact, I would highlight it's not about a country also. It's the thing is so big that you really need to pioneer and get others on board as soon as possible. We don't want to be in a situation where RT is decarbonized, but no one else around us yeah. is because that sort of defeats the purpose. So how can we then show that leadership and get those collaborations across like conglomerates or things like that, uh, we can take those first more risks to a certain extent, give time for our engineers to work with companies, organizations like Project Inner Space, do the feasibility study, do the heavy lifting. And once the report is made, try to get it plugged in with multiple people so that the risk can be more broadly shared. Yeah. But uh, that's the thought process and not looking at just RT itself. Having said that, I'm sure if we are able to achieve in 10 years, we will definitely gain good advantage for sure. So this. 
Look, Arti as a first mover is a terrific uh, concept. Let me broaden that first mover concept to the level of countries. As we heard from Arnaba, India was also a first mover, not only in, how, in, in, in its uptake of clean energy, but in how it did it. It kind of graduated from, or skipped, sidestepped, the Western lavish, expensive model, and immediately uh, did a model that was appropriate for India and catapulted India into the top ranks of clean energy deployers. So I guess my question, maybe I'll come to you, Zareen. Uh, we've talked this entire session about India. What can India, as a first mover, do to help emerging economies or lead the way for emerging economies to adopt this and other exciting technologies, geothermal being just one of them? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think I'd like to answer this question by giving you a use case that succeeded in India, and it succeeded due to scale, the concept of scale that you were talking about. It's the Ujala scheme, and we did the bulk procurement for um, LED bulbs in India, the cost of which was um, several hundred or thousand rupees, I believe, at the time, and then brought the cost down to, I think, 22 or 12 rupees by the end of the program. When you do economies of scale. The, oh, so geothermal energy is expensive, mm. given that we have mid-enthalpy of geothermal power in India. Uh, the, the use case or the test case has to be piloted first to be able to understand what sort of energy is there, what is the use case for it. In order for us to actually answer that question and uh, bring geothermal to become mainstream in India, certain things have to happen. And I think the most important one of those is to be able to bring in the concept of economies of scale that India has mastered in the past, especially with LED bulbs. If we know that there are 350 sites, that is Government of India's data. If you were only able to bring them together to create a demand case, so you lock in demand and you say, we're going to take, you have renewable purchase obligations, right? So you, you don't reinvent the wheel. You just connect the existing dots by bringing demand in. Once you have the demand in, think about it. How many things are sort of smoothened out? Your contracts are smoothened out. The government policy is ironed out. You know exactly what the price point is going to look like. You bring in the competition. You bring in the scale. When you bring in the scale, market forces come into play, you bring down the overall project cost, which in the case of the geothermal power is going to be huge, and you also bring the overall risk down, plus the government at that point knows exactly how to put in uh, viability gap financing. You know exactly what the debt financing comp uh, component is going to look like. When you just, and the single stroke is demand aggregation. Yeah. Aggregate demand, bring up to the scale, the finance will flow. And I think that to me is going to be the mainstreaming of it. I guess what I'd push on here, and this is a real challenge, and I want us to be very clear-eyed uh, when we talk about any country, America, India, etc. Sometimes things don't quite go according to plan. You mentioned renewable purchase obligations. <laughs> yeah. Look, th those have never been remotely enforced, right? And so there's never a stick that says that if a particular utility in India doesn't meet its renewable purchase obligation, they are disincentivized in some way. And so therefore, there's chronic flaunting of the RPO. In this case, this story is like very sensible. It's, you know, in some way, let's ensure that large corporates are uh, ponying up the demand for clean heat, let's say, or clean power. You mentioned, Merrick, that a single Arthi Industries plant, the entire demand of that is smaller than the plant you would need to build, and so therefore you need a constellation of companies in a cluster. And one way to achieve that is to assign some kind of renewable heat obligation, but if it's not followed or enforced, at the end of the day, without strong government enforcement, you're just never gonna get anywhere. How do we crack this nut of policies that actually have teeth. Maybe I'll throw it over to either of you, Amirik or Arnaba. So I, I, I don't think we only need to go down the policy route because the example that Amirik gave has a precedence as well. Our wind industry did not begin because we had a wind entrepreneur. 
we basically had an entrepreneur in the textile play space who wasn't getting enough energy and electricity to run this plant, went to, I'm of course, you know, paraphrasing a long story, but went to some industrial exhibition, saw a wind turbine, bought it, brought it back home, stuck it in their plant, and started generating electricity. And uh, then the neighbor, neighboring textile unit said, oh, what's that? Uh, it's a wind turbine. Can you get one for us? So he goes and gets another one, right? And then a textile company basically becomes the, the country's leading wind company, at least at that time. That's exactly what RT industry seems to be doing, right? It's not a geothermal company. It's a chemicals company that says, I need energy. Can I get energy at a lower cost? So what is, what is the theory of change I'm suggesting here? I started with this proposition. India is the locomotive of the global economy now. And our industries are the locomotive of the Indian economy. So there will be a, another S-curve in the policy and imagination space, not just tech space, where Indian industry is going to say, I really don't care if I am locked in by policy to buy in a linear fashion from a utility. I don't want my factory to shut down, and I'm going to deploy the technology that gets me more and more industrial energy, not just electricity, heat, etc., that I can get competitiveness on. When more and more companies like that do it, especially at a cluster level, policy will follow business rather than the other way around. That being said, there are also signs that policy and regulation in electricity markets are also beginning to change, not just about renewable purchase obligations or like in the US, RP, or renewable purchase standards, but creating the power markets of the future. And that distributed nature of our power system, which can be Small uh, distributed energy projects in rural areas, that alone is a $50 billion livelihoods market. My colleague Abhishek is sitting there. He's mapped that out. Mm. It could be in residential rooftop in urban areas. It could be commercial industrial. The point is, the more you introduce peer-to-peer -peer trading, direct procurement of energy, you basically say that an industry that is, you know, needs to be heavily decarbonized, and an innovator can basically talk to each other. There will be a policy nudge towards it, but I think it will be led by examples that industry set than the other way around. So, uh, if I can add Go there, ahead. so I think one perspective I'll add is uh, the green premium concept, right? So, I would break green premium into green premium of the capex or green premium of the opex. So, in case of geothermal, like my coal is a opex cost for me, and it's a sizable budget. Like RT Industries will have a sizable cost for that fuel. Now, if you look at geothermal OPEX, there will obviously be some parasitic losses and all that, but essentially, there is no fuel because the earth is essentially the fuel. So, it's a capex play. Yeah. And when you have a heavy capex play with a lower OPEX than your normal case, it's about the payback periods at the end of the day. So, right now, my assumption would be you will be at a 7, 8, the first plant will be a 7, 8, 10 year payback period potentially. How can you nudge that gap doing a viability gap financing and things like that? That's for the first plant. As technology improves, if you are at, if you are reaching four or five years of payback, I think then it starts becoming a no-brainer for a lot of the companies to just do it for all of the co-benefits as well uh, in that way. So I, I would say, unlike say converting to natural gas to lower my emissions, where from coal to natural gas is an additional opex, although capex is less then it will forever be challenging for me. In this particular case, it's just about financing the capex, and that is why I think innovative financing to finance the capex should be, can be thought of as an important part of the quote-unquote policy or the financial multilateral banks combination. How do you do that? Maybe after the first sort of pilot is done, that can be one. That's, that's helpful, and I, I do love this idea that you're both alluding to of policy following business and not the other way around. It's a great way of getting our minds around how, how the private sector can really be a leader and meet its own business objectives at the same time, as you said. Look, we, we're, we're running out of time. In the last couple minutes, I just want to pose one 30-second query to each of you. Uh, and that's, look, we're here in New York Climate Week. We're here in the United States. What can economies like the United States, organizations like Interspace, and companies like the ones you see downstairs, 
what can they all do to make geothermal in India and geothermal in emerging markets a reality? That's my question to each of you. Let's go in some random order. I'm going to start with Zareen. 30 seconds each, please. Sure. Thank you, Vern. So I think what we could do, um, what the United States could do, is you have the IRA. Mm -hmm. There are billions of dollars parked in the IRA. And the idea of IRA is to make sure that money gets reinvested into the US economy. And uh, if I were to club it with what is happening with geothermal energy and programs and projects that could potentially be developed in India, I think there is a win-win there. Again, it's all about connecting the dots. The government has to play the role of the deployer of, or the creator of that market. I think Aarti Industries, if I were just to take this case study here, if tomorrow Aarti becomes the decentralized version of solar electricity, which what Government of India promotes, let's take the same example and Aarti becomes the, the decentralized power generation through geothermal projects. If IRA money through DOE could be deployed, that becomes a clear-cut project. And then they, as Mirik just said, they have more generation capacity than they can utilize. Then they can just serve that one industrial area. You create more of these, you use the IRA money to be deployed at overseas projects that generate income, you make it commercially viable, money and policy, everything will flow. So I think that's my 30 second take on it. All right, that's Zirin's idea. Send US money to India. Arunaba. Um, two, two ideas. One is that um, especially in technologies which are at an early level of technology readiness, you know, from a commercial point of view, um, you have to see it to believe it. Right? So it does not matter what a company downstairs has done in the US. India is a large enough market. It's a nearly $4 trillion economy. You can use it as a laboratory mm. at scale. So please deploy your demonstration projects in India mm. right, to, to learn and convince. That's number one. Number two is um, we, we are entering an uncertain world over the remainder of this decade with the EU CBAM and maybe carbon border adjustments even in the United States, which will create more and more friction. Mm. And I've just written in Foreign Affairs uh, of creating an India-US green trade corridor. I think when we look at scope one, two, and three emissions reductions, a lot of US companies that are sourcing from industries that have heavy carbon footprint in India can think about that, not just to solve their net zero plans, but also create a political economy on the Indian side that look, we'll create a new market mm -hmm. and the policy environment for geothermal. If on the other hand, we can leapfrog potential tariff walls that might come up in this country. It's a win-win, it's politically salient, and it's something that a strategic relationship between India and the US can very rapidly capitalize on. That's interesting. So, sorry, you're saying reduce or eliminate, avoid tariff barriers on high carbon goods from India, but in exchange, in India exchange brings a new... Point, geothermal in India. Now that is a trade that may be worth making. Arunaba, this we're going to take... This is not what the Europeans are doing, but the Americans can learn from the European mistakes and we're do a better We're going to take you to the White House from, from New York. Mirk, you have the final uh, words. I, so I think uh, for me, when, I, when we invest... I think Carlos is here also from Quays. So when we invested in Quays and we, when we looked at all geothermal technologies, for me it's all about ensuring that these technologies come to the emerging markets faster than what they would have had in their isolation. So one request would be to Jamie and the Project Inner Space team is also sort of get a roadshow to India and we'll talk to the reliances of the world, the NTPCs of the world from a power perspective. We'll get the clusters. But this interaction needs to speed up. We cannot wait for the technology to reach maturity uh, in 10 years, multiple fields in the US or Europe before it starts doing demonstration plants in India. So we really need to have these parallel tracks, and I think that is where we should accelerate and get a lot of this. And we have talked to Indian companies already. It's not that we haven't, and I know some folks are already talking to Indian companies. I think there is an appetite for innovation, but we just really need to ensure that it's happened in an accelerating pace. So that's my... Great note to end on, everybody. This is how we're going to get geothermal up and running in India and across the emerging economies. You can set up that VR lounge in the CEW office. <laughs> if you hey, he's offered. <laughs> I think we'll take you up on it. Thank you, everyone. Let's go have some lunch. Oh, and back over to David. Thanks.